San Antonio police believe they are connected to a human smuggling case. They took the group into custody early this morning in a shopping center near Loop 410 and Highway 151. Katrina Weber was there as officers chased down some people and found others trying to hide. San Antonio police roped off an area of this far west side parking lot, but they quickly realized not everything or everyone was contained within it. They found themselves running after people, tracking down others trying to hide where they could, inside garbage dumpsters and behind buildings near Loop 410 and Highway 151. A call before four this morning had alerted them to an odd sight involving this semi-truck. Police say when they got here, they saw it too. People pouring out of the back, then scrambling. Officers searched and rounded up as many as 30 men and women, all believed to be tied to a human smuggling case. They say the truck driver was one of them, but most were being smuggled from countries in Central America. Police did their best to search the shopping center, but they admit this is a lot of ground to cover. They say it's very likely that some of the people who were in that truck managed to get away. Police also towed away another vehicle, which they say was involved. They believe that driver was there to meet up with the truck and pick up some of the people. Instead, investigators with the Department of Homeland Security took custody of everyone and took over the case. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. On scene, who tells us they received the call just before 4 o'clock this morning that someone had seen someone coming out of trucks. So many people coming out of these trucks. So when the officers did arrive on scene, they did say they saw several people just running all over the place, at least more than 20 to 25 people in that range. And then they were focusing on this parking lot behind me because they say that some of these people were pick here to pick those migrants up. Those people have been detained. Now, they tell us they detained about 25 people. They were put in those vans that were here just a moment ago. But they do tell us that the Department of Homeland Security is taking over this investigation now. The police were assisting. They brought the Eagle over as well as the K-9 unit. The K-9 unit was here just a few moments ago. Now, that truck that we were telling you about that was carrying those migrants, that's not the truck that's located behind me. None of those trucks are those that truck involved in that. The truck that was carrying those migrants are, is located behind the shopping center where we are right now. We saw three people getting detained. It's in that same shopping center that we saw those people getting detained. Two men and one woman. Now they say they're not entirely sure who the driver is right now. They have a couple of suspects at this time but they could not confirm. Some of the people that were coming to pick up some of those migrants, they have also been detained but they said they were going to continue on with their investigation. Fire department did arrive. They helped supply with those migrants some water and Gatorade as well. Some injuries were sustained, but uh, as the sergeant on scene tells us, it was mostly just those police officers from running around. Uh, they were, did receive some cuts and bruises, but we're going to be following this situation. Uh, police did move on, but we are going to bring you the latest. Reporting from the west side, I'm Melissa Teas, Kens 5 Eyewitness News. Latest news at the southern U.S. border, where agents are facing a consistent flow of migrants crossing into the U.S., many the result of human smuggling attempts. Officials at the border say this is the most activity they've seen in years. Border correspondent Robert Sherman is live with a look at the measures agents are taking to combat this human smuggling crisis. Robert. Good morning, Adrian. We actually tagged along with Texas DPS, both on the ground and in the air, to get a better idea of what they're doing to combat human smuggling. And to put it simply, they're facing a lot of challenges down here. Saddled up and strapped in, we set off from Del Rio, Texas. Beneath us, an endless sea of ranch land, dirt, and brush. An endless sea of places to hide. This is a never-ending uh, process. That mouse game, I mean, you know, they try to get away, we try to catch them. Lieutenant Donnie Kindred has been flying for Texas DPS for the last eight years, but he's never seen the Del Rio sector this hot with migrant activity. The amount of uh, pursuits and the length of pursuits these people will go through to try to get away, even with a helicopter overhead, we've had pursuits that have gone on for 80 miles. Largely behind the surge in this area, human smuggling. This is very common, especially here in the Del Rio sector. We tagged along with Lieutenant Chris Oliveras Monday night. And News Nation exclusively witnessed a human smuggling bust leading to nine migrant apprehensions. This truck sped away during a traffic stop, drove through a fence and into the brush. It had been stolen from San Antonio solely 
to be used for smuggling. It's very profitable, especially for these human smugglers, uh, to take part in this, you know, in, in part of human smuggling because they're getting paid thousands to smuggle people. Despite the nine apprehensions, the driver ended up getting away. Between the ground and air, lots of resources are being thrown at securing the border, but it never seems to be quite enough. Texas is huge. We'll never have enough personnel to cover the border like it should be covered. Um, but, you know, we do the best we can with the amount of people and resources we have. And to put that into perspective, Monday we witnessed nine arrests during that human smuggling bust, but at least one person got away. Tuesday, when we were up in the helicopter, we did see another human smuggling bust, but once again, another person got away. So despite all these resources that are being put in the field, it just goes to show how difficult it is to secure the U.S. southern border. The News for Tucson investigators first exposed the growing trend of popular peer-to-peer -peer rental car services being used for border crimes last year. Tucson Border Patrol agents recently stopped an attempted human smuggling in a peer-to-peer -peer rental car near NACO. Chorus Nylander joins us live from CBP headquarters tonight with more. Chorus. Well, Amanda, Tucson Sector Border Patrol says its high-tech camera systems were able to alert agents to a pair of undocumented immigrants entering an SUV near the Brian A. Terry Station near NACO last week. Inside of that SUV, agents found two handguns they say were underneath the seats. Border Patrol says the driver was a U.S. citizen. According to a post from Border Patrol on Facebook, the SUV was rented out as part of a peer-to-peer -peer rental service. Last year, the News 4 Tucson investigators exposed the growing trend of these peer-to-peer -peer rental cars being used for crime and particularly being used for crimes along the border. We heard from several people who rented out their cars only to have them seized by Border Patrol for months after being used uh, for crimes. Border Patrol says it doesn't track the amount of peer-to-peer -peer rentals that have been involved in criminal activity. But in December, a Border Patrol Special Operations Supervisor told us they've definitely been seeing it more often. We've seen an increase in the uh, amount of seizures that we've made with vehicles that have been used uh, in smuggling and other activities that originate from peer-to-peer -peer, uh, rental services. We may not have any idea it's been a vehicle that was rented out to somebody um, until the owner of the vehicle eventually gets in touch with us. In this latest case in NACO, Border Patrol says the driver has been arrested, faces prosecution. No agents were injured. Investigating for you live from Tucson Border Patrol headquarters tonight, Cora Snylander, News 4 Tucson. Well, the former acting Homeland Security Secretary, Chad Wolf, joins us now. He is also a visiting fellow at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, you had the job of of trying to ensure, among other things, that the border is secure in this country. As you look at what the Biden administration is doing, what's your reaction? Well, they're not doing much. Uh, unfortunately, we still have the worst border crisis that we've seen uh, in our lifetimes and really ever along that border. And so they're not uh, talking about new policies. They're not talking about new enforcement actions along that border to try to curb some of this illegal apprehensions that we see. Inst instead, it's just more of the same. So over 2 million illegal apprehensions last calendar year. Uh, we see that number continuing. The reporting uh, from Bill uh, indicates as much. It continues to be a very busy place along that border in the Rio Grande Valley because we know uh, that the Biden administration is not serious about upholding the rule of law and actually enforcing uh, border security. Yeah, let's take a look at the numbers. Fiscal year 2021 versus 2022. Uh, the number of uh, uh, southwest border encounters, they call it, 218,000 in 2021. This is just the first quarter. In 2022, the first quarter, 518,000. That's up 138 uh, percent. This crisis shows no sign of abating, Chad. Yeah, absolutely not. Uh, it will continue. This is, again, I think it's important to remember, though, that this is a self-inflicted crisis. It didn't need to occur. The border was uh, under control at the end of the Trump administration. We had given them a playbook to continue some of those uh, uh, procedures and policies. They chose not to. And so they have created this crisis that we see over the last 12 months, but they don't seem to be interested in solving it. Every time we hear the DHS secretary talk, he talks about they have a plan and they're executing the plan. And so I have to say that this is what they uh, are choosing to do uh, with border security is basically erode it, destroy it, 
and you see the, the catch and release policies, uh, failed catch and release policies uh, every day. Well, at, at his inauguration, President Biden put his hand on a Bible and swore to faithfully uphold and, and defend the laws of the United States. It is illegal to come across the southern border. Why does the president not seem interested in, in defending the border? Uh, it, it, it's a great question. And I think, you know, we, we see Border Patrol really at their wits end. Uh, there was leaked video uh, a week or so ago, them confronting the secretary saying, you need to do your job. Let us do our job because they're handcuffing the Border Patrol and, and they're not able to apprehend individuals. Some of the gang members that Bill talked about at the, at the beginning of the segment, we know those individuals are crossing the border. Uh, but when you don't let Border Patrol do their job and you don't provide them leadership, which the Biden administration is not doing, then basically you're, you're saying it's open season and everyone can come across that border. And that's why we are seeing historic numbers. And if you remember, they try to justify it, saying it was first it was the Trump administration's fault, then it was seasonal, and then it was cyclical. Uh, they refuse to actually say why it's occurring, which is because they have torn down policies and have chosen not to replace them with anything that is meaningful in any, any measure. Well, and then there's the drug smuggling. Let's take a look at some of the numbers on uh, fentanyl uh, seizures in this country. 2,804 pounds seized in fiscal year uh, 2019. It roughly doubled 4,791 pounds in fiscal year 2020, 11,200 pounds in fiscal year 21, and in just the first quarter of uh, 22, 2,707 pounds of fentanyl have been seized. Is it any wonder that fentanyl overdose deaths have reached, have, have skyrocketed really to the worst ever in this country? Uh, unfortunately, it's not. I think if you go back to 2018 and 2019 in the Trump administration, we took certain measures to stop some of that fentanyl coming in from China, which is where the majority of this originates from, through express consignment, such as UPS and FedEx and DHL. And because we did that, those uh, that fentanyl is now going to Mexico and then through our southern border. The Biden administration knows this. Uh, but what we see down there with the human smuggling is the cartels are making millions of dollars every day and they're able to put those proceeds back into the illegal narcotics and smuggle more and more across that border every day, which is going into communities, killing Americans every day. And so when we talk about the border crisis, it's not just a, a crisis of individuals coming across, but it's also the narcot n illegal narcotics. The two are tied together. You can't talk to, about one without addressing the other. Uh, and again, this administration is not interested really in addressing either. Yeah, it would be good to see the president or maybe his vice president addressing the problem. Former acting DHS secretary Chad Wolf, thanks very much. Forests and pump millions of dollars into the local economy. But a new six investigation reveals they are also a critical highway for human trafficking and human smuggling. Investigator Eric Sandoval found out incidents are on the rise. We are right along I-75 here in Sumter County, and we found out this area ranks third when it comes to the number of human trafficking and human smuggling cases intercepted by Florida Highway Patrol troopers. And those are just the cases they know about. So we actively look for felonies, drugs, smugglers, and anyone committing felonies on the highway. But this trooper with FHP's Crime Interdiction Unit says he's really seeing an uptick in human trafficking and smuggling. I mean, I think we're seeing it a lot more because we're looking for it a lot more. We're not showing his face because he works undercover. We had a van from Texas bringing about 12 undocumented individuals into the county. They were ranged from 12 years old up to adults. They were being brought into Florida by a individual getting paid by whoever that he works for to bring them into Florida. What were they being brought here for? That's what we don't know. He says that incident was the result of an educated hunch on a city street. But the problem is flowing from Florida's interstates. New 6 analyzed records covering the last five years, and we found out FHP troopers have intercepted 126 incidents statewide involving suspected human trafficking or smuggling. Half of those incidents happened along I-75, the longest stretch of interstate east of the Mississippi. Eight of them happened in Sumter County, many of them within the last four months alone. Troopers shared these pictures from those incidents, showing the dark window tint that prompted them to pull the drivers over. Inside, they say they found passengers from Mexico, Guatemala, and Honduras, 
all of them suspected of being trafficked to South Florida, possibly to be put to work. It's definitely growing with uh, more population, more construction, more jobs. There's a shortage uh, like never before, so we believe it's going to get worse. Tomas Loris is the founder of United Abolitionists, a group that works to combat human trafficking in Central Florida. He says he fears a shortage of workers could mean more people being forced into slave labor. Now, the work is not maybe what they thought it was. The pay is not what they thought it was. They actually have to uh, pay for rent and transportation and food and water. And so they even uh, end up being in debt which is debt bondage. Now, just last week, the U.S. Department of Justice announced it is getting involved to help get results and stop these traffickers. Part of their plan includes developing human trafficking task forces that would work right alongside local law enforcement. Their goal is more attention on the roadways and more training. We're going to be watching to see if it's enough. In Sumter County, Eric Sandoval, getting results, News 6. For more on the crisis at our southern border, joining me now is former Border Patrol Chief Rodney Scott. He is a distinguished fellow at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Chief Scott, thank you for taking time. You just heard Bill Malusian's great report down there in La Jolla, part of the RGV sector. You are all too well familiar with that. I actually want to show our viewers just how busy it's been. In the last 24 hours, sources with CBP giving me the actual numbers. In the RGV, 1,364 encounters, up 124%. In Del Rio, 1,235 encounters, 202%. In El Paso, just over 1,000, up 68%. Chief Scott, this has been going on every single day for more than a year. Your thoughts? Hey, thank you for having me on, Griff. You, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, about t March 2021, the secretary went on TV on all the talk shows and said they had a plan, they were acting on a plan, and the plan was successful and the border was secure. Uh, I, I've come to the conclusion this is their plan, to have the border open. That you, you couldn't make all these decisions and have them be by accident. Uh, and it shows, but Bill's report was great. It shows when agents are allowed to do their job, they're very effective and they will help keep real threats out of this country. But unfortunately, most of them right now are babysitting and processing. They're not out in the field. Miles of border are open and we have no idea what we're missing. And Chief, so you're actually saying you believe this could actually be intentional. I, I've avoided over the last year trying to like speculate, but I cannot look at somebody like the secretary of DHS and his experience and background and his knowledge and then look at the decisions that he's making to maintain and to really create an open border and come up with any other conclusion that it's intentional. But I'll let your viewers decide for themselves. Just look at the evidence and the facts, not the words. Chief, I want to address one part of this story that's tragic, and that is the toll it has taken on the morale. Now you have uniform agents standing up to leadership. Yesterday on our air, your successor, Chief Roll Ortiz, was asked about that morale. Here's what he had to say. Take a listen. The morale is certainly going to be a challenge for us, not just because we're dealing with, you know, this humanitarian push that's coming us at us from 140 different countries, but also because we're dealing with it in a COVID environment. On any given day, I may have four or 500 officers that are in a quarantine status. Chief, your thoughts. So, again, I'll try to stay out of the politics, but it is a significant threat. Morale's tanked out. Uh, they hear the secretary stating that he cares and that, that uh, He's going to take these actions. But then even what he states on paper, increasing the prosecutions for assaults, he has no control over that. That's a U.S. attorney's office. It's all words. The agents see the actions every single day. And the actions are they're being told to process people and release them into the United States faster. And they know that all that means is that more are going to continue to keep coming. This is the first administration most of these agents, including myself, have ever seen that had no intention of securing the border and takes no actions to try to secure the border. Chief, I learned from you right after you retired, you spoke about this becoming a national security crisis, not just a border crisis. And in the months since, we have seen individuals being apprehended from Syria, from Tajikistan, from Russia, from Ukraine, all over the world. Is it your sense that the national security threat is worsening? It's worsening every day, Griff. It's horrible, to be quite honest. So, again, Bill showed what agents can do when they're allowed to be out in the field. 
But I'm getting reports from agents and leadership in the Border Patrol that because of the focus on processing and this, the, the flow that won't stop, hundreds and hundreds of miles of border are left wide open, and we simply don't know what's crossing. What we do know is the demographics have changed just statistically, and they're catching more people from other countries, countries not from the Northern Triangle, not Mexico, all the countries you, you just mentioned, increasing over and over. And what's, what's in that group? We just don't know. And the number of gotaways increasing. In fact, in the RGV where Bill was, they've got just over 16,500 known gotaways. Chief Rodney Scott, thank you for your insight. So important. Thanks for taking time on Saturday, sir. Thank you, Griff. Have a great day. You too. Anita? U.S. Border Patrol Chief Raul Ortiz joins us now. First off, thank you very much for being here, sir. How would you currently describe the conditions and the state of the southern border as it is today? Yeah, thank you, Sandra, for having me today. I'll tell you that uh, across the southwest border from San Diego all the way down to South Texas, our agents are doing a phenomenal job of interdicting, rescuing, and certainly addressing some of these migration surges that we've seen really over the last eight years. You know, a lot of people want to talk about that this is a recent migration surge, but I was deployed in South Texas in 2014 through 2019, and we saw surges of unaccompanied children and family units, and we continue to see some of that same traffic across all nine of our southwest border sectors. Chief, we know that morale's been a problem. We've seen the video of the back and forth between you and border agents voicing their frustrations. I want to get your response to that, but first for our viewers to take a listen. I've been doing this job as long as y'all. That's the problem. What's that? That's the problem, Chief. For, for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. That's I can't hear that. For evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. That's exactly what's happening here. Good men are doing nothing. You're allowing the legal aliens to drop off communities. You are doing something. No, sir, we're not. You for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. What has come of that since we all were able to see the frustrations firsthand with that exchange? Yeah, it certainly was a tense exchange, but it was also a very productive exchange. I'll tell you that Secretary Mayorkas and I were able to visit our teams in Yuma, El Paso, and Laredo sector over that three-day period, and we were able to di dialogue and have conversations with our frontline officers and our mission support personnel. And we understood that we were going to hear uh, some of the frustrations, and, but we also got very productive feedback. Just in this last week, the secretary issued two memoranda really focused on that trip. One, centered around making sure that the Department of Justice prosecutes anybody who assaults our agents out there, and we've had 182 of those assaults. And the second one was making sure we got our processing coordinators into those processing centers so our Border Patrol agents could get back out on the front lines. And that was a big part of those frustrations, is those agents want to be able to get out there and do their job each and every day. Chief, I'm happy to hear you say some progress came out of that, that, that show of frustration there. How would you describe the morale today? Okay. So the morale is certainly going to be a challenge for us, not just because we're dealing with, you know, this humanitarian push that's coming us at us from 140 different countries, but also because we're dealing with it in a COVID environment. On any given day, I may have four or 500 officers that are in a quarantine status. So when uh, a lot of departments and agencies out there are still managing in this office environment, my officers and agents are exposed out there to these migrant populations who we're dealing with this in a pandemic. And so it really puts a, an extra strain on our workforce. This, you know, over these last two years, I've lost 19 officers uh, to COVID and two contractors. And as a whole, CBP has lost over 60 officers. So that really has put us in a difficult situation. But I do think that as an organization, we've shown, shown tremendous resilience. And I'm awfully proud of the work that they're doing each and every day. Uh, I thank you very much, Chief, for joining us here. Appreciate your time. Appreciate your efforts. As a country, we say thank you for keeping us safe. Thank you. I appreciate it, Sandra. Thank you. All right.